rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning and welcome. Uh, before we continue with the agenda, I'd like to uh, formally recognize uh, Student Government Day. There's a proclamation that I'll read here in just a minute, but I'd like to welcome uh, uh, students from the Hutchinson and Glencoe Silver Lake area schools and thank them for being here with us. We just had a, a nice uh, question and answer session with the board and they will uh, be with us throughout the meeting and uh, throughout the day for different presentations and tours. With that, um, I'd like to uh, move on in the agenda and consideration of agenda items. I would like to uh, pull item D under public works for a future date. If there are no objections, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Polmeyer, second by Commissioner Wright to approve the agenda with the correction. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consent agenda. Move to approve, Mr. Chair. Motion by Commissioner Kruger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Polmeyer. And for the audience, consent agenda is just some regular business that uh, any commissioner can pull um, for further discussion, but if not, it is a, a group of uh, actions that can be taken together. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Did, this, did the audience have a copy of our agenda? I believe they do. Okay. Did you get a copy of the agenda in the packets? Oh, yeah, they did. Any further discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have uh, two different proclamations this morning that I will read. The first one is in reference to the uh, Student Government Day, so bear with me. Whereas the nation's 3,069 3 counties serving more than 30 million Americans provide essential services to create healthy, safe, and vibrant communities, and whereas counties provide health services, administer justice, keep communities safe, foster economic opportunities, and much more, and whereas McLeod County and all counties take pride in our responsibility to protect and enhance the health, welfare, and safety of our residents in an efficient and cost-effective ways, and Whereas the National Association of Counties, NACO, President Greg Cox, Connecting the Unconnected Initiative is, determined, is demonstrating how counties deliver people-centered services to our residents nationwide. And whereas each year since 1991, the NACO has, has encouraged counties across the country to elevate awareness of county responsibilities programs and services, and whereas McLeod County employees serve 14 townships, nine cities, while striving to improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement. Now, therefore, be it further resolved that I, Joe Nagel, do hereby proclaim April 2019 as National County Government Month and encourage all county officials, employees, schools, and residents to participate in county government to celebrate in county gov government celebration activities. So one more, so bear with me. <laughs> this will be the most painful part of the meeting, kids, <laughs> I promise. Uh, the next is a proclamation, uh, National Public Health Week, uh, April 1st through the 7th, 2019. Whereas since, the, since 1995, the American Public Health Association through the sponsorship of National Public Health Week has educated the public policymakers and public health professionals about issuing the importance of improving the public health and whereas there is a significant difference in health status, such as obesity, poor mental health and drug use among people living in rural areas compared with people living in urban areas, and the variance increases because rural residents are, are often more likely to face so, social detriments and negatively impact such health as transporta 
such as poverty, transportation barriers, and lack of economic opportunity, and whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare, withstand, and recover for the impact of a full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks, such as measles, natural disasters, and disasters caused by human activity, and whereas public health action, together with scientific and technological advances, has played a major role in reducing and in some cases eliminating the spread of infectious disease and in establishing today's disease surveillance and control systems. And whereas 60% of Americans live with a preventable chronic disease and health risks such as alcoholism, obesity, tobacco use are the primary reason for seven of every 10 deaths annually in the United States. Now, therefore, be it further resolved that I, Joe Nagel, do hereby proclaim April 1st to the 7th, 2019, as National Public Health Week in McLeod County, encourage, and encourage all county officials, employees, schools, and residents to observe this week by helping our families, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and leaders better understand the value of public health and supporting great opportunities to adopt preventative lifestyle habits. Thank you. All right. With that, and moving right into that, we have a, a presentation from Public Health. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and thank you for having us. I'm Amanda Marsh and I'm the Public Health Nursing Supervisor and I am here to introduce Jamie Kraut. She is one of our health educators and she will be reading um, A Day in the Life of a Minnesotan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks to the effort of local, state, and federal public health agencies, people in Minnesota are able to live healthier and longer. Most people are unaware of the work and the partnerships involved. To get a better picture of how public health helps you, here's a description of the average day in a life of a Minnesotan. 6.15 a.m. After showering, you brush your teeth. Safe drinking water is the responsibility of public health working with county environmental services and, and solid waste management. A quick check of your smile in the mirror reminds you that you have no cavities. Thanks to fluoride in the water, another public health service that a that prevents approximately 65% of all tooth decay at a cost of only about 50 cents per person per year. 7 a.m., you hear your son laughing in the other room as your spouse gets him ready for the child care center. Public health has assured that he is a healthy baby thanks to immunizations that ward off diseases that used to be deadly. 7.30 a.m., it's time to leave for work. You buckle your son in his car seat and fasten your seatbelt before pulling out of the driveway. Public health advocates for seatbelt laws, child passenger safety laws, and educates the public about buckling their children correctly in their car seats. The Toward Zero Death Partnership has resulted in fewer deaths and fewer severe injuries on Minnesota highways. As you pull around the bicycle is sharing the road with you, you appreciate public health for supporting the use of helmets by all bicyclists. 8.05 a.m. at your desk on time, well, almost. Work is good and relatively stress-free. You are happy that your business is a tobacco-free working environment. It has become clear through the years that smoking and tobacco use has definite links to cancer and other chronic diseases. Evidence shows that changing unhealthy lifestyles ent entails working with policymakers to change the environment that fosters them, improving the overall quality of life for all community members. 12.05 p.m., it's lunchtime. You feel good because you have started a lunchtime walking program with five of your colleagues. The exercise increases aerobic fitness and helps your stress level for the rest of the afternoon. Public health studies have shown the positive effects of avoiding or lessening the risks of chronic disease by exercising routinely. 6 p.m., on your way home, you see a young family out for a walk with their baby in a stroller. You smile at seeing a family off to a good start in life. This family benefited from prenatal visits with a public health nurse and follow-up with a local health care provider. Public health works with families on having healthy babies and family planning. 
10.30 p.m., your family goes to sleep, public health has touched your life in countless, countless ways today, although you have not even been aware of most of them. Public health works with partners in the community to prevent health problems before they are a problem for your family. Currently, priority areas in Meeker McLeod and Sibley um, Community Health Services address obesity, mental health, senior health, access, health equity, and alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Thank you again for having us this morning and for declaring April 1st through the 7th, 2019 as National Public Health Week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does the board have any questions for Jamie or Amanda? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, moving on in the agenda. Uh, informational services, I believe Vince is gone. Sheila, you're gonna take that? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Asking you to consider approval of, of annual maintenance services for checkpoint firewall appliances by Fireverse Incorporated for $23,974 from the Information Technology 2019 budget. The department received two quotes, one from Fireverse for $23,974 and one from Insight for $24,423.31. The department had contracted with Insight in the past for these maintenance services who are on state contract. Um, Vince did ask me to let you know that the reason for re reconsidering who to have the contract with is because of the lower price. Any questions? If not, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the uh, request for uh, annual maintenance uh, from Checkpoint Firewall for the Checkpoint from Fireverse. Motion by Commissioner Shemansky. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Kruger. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Sheila, are you? Uh, able to answer any questions uh, regarding the, the, the difference in the two bids and uh, is there an advantage uh, other than price to, to use one? I'm not able to answer other? anything except for the cost reasons. Okay. No, sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing now, we proceed to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, in the next two items, should we stay on time for those? Um, considering some people may arrive. That's a good idea. Okay. Sheila, can I put you on the spot um, and take your items off uh, county administration right now? Yes. Thank you. So everybody, we'll be under, <coughs> in your agendas, it's under county administration, and I think we're going to hear A, B, and C, correct? Yes. Um, the reason that we're uh, moving to that is that items that were scheduled next and that were scheduled for 920 and 925 could potentially have uh, public comment so we want to make sure we don't start early or at least too early where we can make sure the public arrives so that's why we're uh, rearranging the agenda so sheila whenever you're ready thank you item a under county administration <coughs> Asking you to consider approval to add $150 <coughs> per pay period to Donna Kraut's wage on an interim basis beginning on March 20th, 2019. So that would be a retro payment. The increase is due to the added responsibility of her role while supervising the child support unit in, an, in absence of a health and human services director. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the uh, additional compensation for uh, Donna Krauth's wages. Motion by Commissioner Schmansky. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Polmeyer. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. Thank you. Item B, asking you to consider approval to continue the temporary increase of hours for a half-time child support officer from 20 hours per week up to 28 hours per week through October 4th, 2019. This is the second extension request, if you may recall. When was the first one, do you recall? I don't, I'm sorry. That's okay. <coughs> right. I don't have an exact date. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Wright, is there a second? I'll second. 
Second by Commissioner Pohlmeyer. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Sheila, uh, since this is an increase in hours, uh, is there a budget impact uh, that does this fit within the budget of the agency? It did last time, um, Commissioner. The, the cost last time was $674 for the full extension period. I assume that this would be similar with a 3% increase from the 2019 wage increase. Okay. Um, and that was over the whole course of the contract ex or the extension of hours. Okay. All right. Which Thank we're you. currently at. So. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item C. Asking you to consider approval to accept the recommendation of the Personnel Committee to increase the grade of the Financial Assistance Supervisor position from grade 180 to grade 200. All of the other social services supervisors are currently at a grade 200, except for this role. Mr. Chair, I'll move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Pohlmeyer. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Schemanski. Is there any discussion? And this was one that was on the list from the Keystone study some time ago, right? It was yes. just another one checked off the list that we addressed. It was placed at a, one, at a grade 180, and after talking and discussing it more with our current evaluation committee, we decided it would be best to review the position, and it, was, it came out at a grade 200. Very good. Any further discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Cindy, let's just fin finish county administration if we can. Sure. And I think it's just the notification, right? Yes, I, item D under administration is the notification of an upcoming McLeod County Board workshop to be held on April 16th following the county board meeting here at the Glencoe City Center. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, Soil and water, Adam. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this morning I'm asking you to consider approval for Houston Engineering out of Maple Grove to provide a determination of the as constructed and subsequently improved condition um, ditch profile for portions of County Ditch 32 for a cost of 10,800 uh, from the, from, to come from the County Ditch 32 fund. Mr. Chair, I move to approve 20-642 for the Houston Engineering to do the study. I'll second. Motion by Commissioner Kruger, second by Commissioner Polmeyer. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, working on this uh, county ditch, this is to give us the information we need to make sure that the uh, ditch is operating the way it was originally designed. Um, there are some questions regarding some of the culverts going under, I believe it's County Road 15, and this should give us the answer of whether they are placed properly or placed improperly. Correct. So that, that, that is the reason for this study. Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Oh. Go ahead, Mike. Perhaps it might be a good idea for the audience and for those on, the, on, on media for Adam to explain what a county ditch is, how it's funded, and what its purpose is. Not to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, basically, the county ditches, um, the uh, landowners, the landowner's ditches, and the assessments go straight back to the landowners. Um, as for any work that is done, uh, repairs, um, those as well go back to the landowners to, for repairs to whatever needs to be done to keep the ditches flowing and things like that. What does a county ditch do? Basically, it um, helps with taking the water and getting getting uh, fields drained out and everything else uh, that has to do with um, drainage of the county. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. If I may expand on Adam's uh, description there, but basically, a, a county ditch or a drainage system, whether it be tiles or ditch, uh, helps farmers uh, access more tillable acres. Uh, what naturally, uh, you know, after the, the glaciers arrived here, uh, made some potholes in our countryside. The, the uh, drainage system, which is uh, authorized by the landowners affected by it, um, helps drain the water away so that they have, uh, you know, 
more tillable acres on their farms and uh, consequently they <clears throat> pay for the maintenance and upkeep of the ditch systems and so it's not a not a general burden on the taxpayers of the county but it is paid for by the actual users of the system mr. chair yes just to expand on that yeah, did it, I want to emphasize it's not like in town or the city owns the inner structure it actually belongs these ditches are we, we uh, we just manage them and facilitate things that are going on with the ditch. Uh, the the f landowners direct um, some things they want done. We are mandated through uh, a ditch law to make sure that the ditches are running, uh, I guess, to the best of their ability, lack of another word, but that they're functioning to get the drainage off the field. This particular Crossing that there we're talking about this morning uh, was replaced a number of years ago, and there's some question on whether it's at the right height. That's that's the reason for bringing in the uh, engineers to uh, figure that out. There's some question on whether um, it was set in the right angle. So these things will all all be taken out. It is. It's not like a road ditch. It's a, it's the ditch that crosses and and carries the water under the road per se so I, I hope that makes it a little more clear all right there's a motion on the table any further discussion hearing now proceed to vote all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed motion carries thank you Adam thank you environmental services Good morning Mark Two items in front of you this morning. The first item is just a housekeeping item, and that is a consideration approval of resolution 19-CV-20, uh, Hutchinson Joint Planning Area Airport Zoning Amendment. On June 22, 2018, the Hutchinson Joint Planning Area Board unanimously recommended approval to adopt the proposed airport zoning ordinance amendments, creating a crosswind runway option at the Hutchinson Municipal Airport. On July 3rd, 2018, the McLeod County Board of Commissioners unanimously adopted the zoning ordinance amendments recommended by the Hutchinson Joint Planning Area Board. With this request, MnDOT um, is asking for us to basically verify that we went through the proper procedure to adopt these changes. Bolton Mink is the contract um, consultant with the City of Hutchinson that is facilitating this, and they've had some changeover. So with that being said, MnDOT just wants to verify that we did follow procedure. All right, any questions for Mark? Mr. Chair? Yes. Mark, so with this amendment, we're, we're, we're just authorizing the resolution to adopt the amendment that was made last year. Is, is that how you explain <laughs> that? Or? Yes, the resolution basically is stating that we followed the proper steps in the resolution. I can read that for the public if we so choose, but in the resolution it just states that that the Joint Planning Board held the, the public hearing and that after public hearing, the County Board did adopt the findings of the recommendations through the consultant. Okay, all right, thank you, Mark. Mr. Chair, yes. I, I know we are all kind of smiling here, but but I had the same question. I thought we'd, we approved this once before, so this is approving, are they just dotting their I's and crossing their T's? That all really amounts to it? Yes, there was some change over with Bolton Mink and the-, the Okay. The, the consultant that was working on this has moved on to a different organization. So there were some new members and MnDOT, okay. I believe needed to verify that the procedure was done properly, that there was a public hearing held. We do not hold the public hearing. We have the opportunity to extend that at this body, as you all know. Uh, the public hearing was held at the Hutchinson Area Joint Planning Ordinance and there was some consideration with neighbors in attendance at that time, notification was very thorough. So the process that we used was very similar to what we've done for any other amendment um, to ordinance. And um, one's not contradicting the other. I mean, it's just it's yeah. It was just this is just a housekeeping item to to appease the powers that are going to have to supply funding. Mr. Chair, I'd move to approve this resolution. 19 CB 20. Motion by Commissioner Polmeyer. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Wright. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item B is a conditional use permit request, and it 
We, the item is to consider approval of mining conditional use permit 19-03 by Craig Reiner, Reiner Contracting, to continue mining, crushing, stockpiling, and recycling concrete and asphalt for a five-year time period with the following conditions. Number one, the applicant shall submit a bond or letter of credit to the McLeod County Environmental Services by April 15, 2019 in the amount of $8,000. Number two, the hours of operation are Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Crushing shall not occur prior to 8 a.m. during hours of operation. Number three, crushing is allowed to occur in the pit area. Number four, applicants shall meet all state national pollutant discharge elimination system, NPDES for short acronym, requirements and apply for Department of Natural Resources DNR dewatering permit if needed. Number five, the applicant shall follow all mining standards contained in section 16 of the McLeod County Zoning Ordinance, if not further restricted by this permit. Number six, stockpiling of recyclable concrete and asphalt shall be permitted in the surveyed pit area. Number seven, applicants shall restore the pit area to a four to one backslope for non-farming. Number eight, McLeod County Environmental Services shall inspect all restoration work completed and approved with letter acknowledging completion to release the bond or letter of credit back to the applicant. The pit was originally permitted in 2013. The haul route from the pit access directly enters onto Vista Road, which is County Road 19, which is a paved access. Stockpiles will not be higher than 34 feet in height. Applicant does not intend to utilize dust control or noise measures in the pit area due to the excavation being below the adjacent natural grade. The location is 7.55 acres of Section 14 in Acoma Township. The Acoma Township Board unanimously recommended approval on March 14, 2019. The planning, com the planning Advisory Committee unanimously recommended approval on March 27, 2019 with the above conditions. The reason it's in front of you today is there was some discussion with one of the neighbors in regards to the hours of operation. We have mitigated those. Um, Mr. Reiner is in agreement with those hours of operation. He's here today if you have questions for him. The neighbor was satisfied with uh, the amendment to the original permit and the conditions. Acoma Township did recommend this and they recommended this with the original conditions on there and some of those conditions needed to be worked through a little bit so I do appreciate Mr. Reiner's attendance at our planning commission as well as the neighbors to work through those so if there's any questions I can get into these conditions a little bit further but we had a thorough conversation at our at our planning commission and, and the process worked well. Mr. Mr. Chair. No, go ahead. Uh, we put Adam on the spot and so we have a captive audience here so <laughs> Maybe you want to explain, uh, I mean, we do these all the time, so we get it, but you might want us, it's not specific to this pit, you might want to tell the students how, how come we have to do this and the procedure that it went through the planning commission, the townships, the neighbors, you might just touch on that a little sure. bit. Sure. So a conditional use permit is, is a lot of people will believe they're a, they're a permitted use with conditions. I like to look at them a little bit differently. There's uses established in ordinance either as a permitted use which means they're granted or they come to our office and they have to obtain a permit from us for construction. Conditional uses are a little bit different than that. They are a use that is regulated by the board, by yourself, through the adoption of an ordinance. And if we feel that it's not injurious to the neighbor, to the neighbors, to the locality, or to the public, we have the right through a checklist, if you will, to approve these uses, and if we feel that we need to attach conditions on them, we can do that. Uh, gravel mining is one of them. Uh, not that it is a contentious issue, but it can be, and it gives the right for those applicants to be able to take the gravel, the sand, the rock, clay, any earthen material out of the earth, as long as there are conditions that are met when they take it out, as far as how it's being done, hours of operation, so forth and so on, and then to what standard it gets reapplied to. So a conditional use permit, as stated, a lot of people like to refer to that as a permitted use with conditions, but I like to look at it as more of a checklist that has to be met to make sure that we're not impacting the public or the neighbors. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mark, um, <clears throat> there's a stipulation in here that the uh, stockpiles will not exceed 34 feet in height. I don't recall seeing that in, in previous uh, mining permits. Is this a uh, Specific to this pit, or it's no, it just isn't, a Mr. Reiner. Question. Mr. Reiner did put that in his reclamation standards. Therefore, I just carried it forward. There is some concern, obviously, with some of the height of those stockpiles. Occasionally, in a more populated area, we will see some concern in regards to that because it potentially might block view sunrise or from the river or a lake or etc. 
So with that being said, we carried that condition forward. Mr. Reiner is not objecting to that. Um, the stockpile that he's going to have is like likely going to be below grade. It's not going to be above grade, so it really does not impact um, the neighbors or typical conditional use permits for mining. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, <clears throat> Mark. One of the things you know this this particular uh, gravel pit is on a blacktop road. Uh, in, you know, some of these students at some point may want to live in the country on a gravel road. Uh, we do have the issue with uh, the haul routes uh, when they're on gravel roads, and maybe just want to recap that a little bit for you know dust control and those types of things. Sure, and that was the reason why this really is here today. One of the neighbors had some concerns in regards to the operation. Not that he opposed the mining part of it; it had to do with trucks coming in and the start of the operation on the road. The road creates some traffic noise that potentially could impact someone's sleeping <coughs> habits or if they were entertaining at the time. So if you take that from a tar road to a gravel road and now you have 50 more trips per day on that gravel road past your house, there might be an issue with doy, uh, dust, there might be an issue with noise. So if we were in that situation where this pit was on a gravel road, more than likely you would have a condition brought forward as dust control measures where the applicant would have to either water that stretch of the road to keep the dust down or potentially apply some form of a dust control calcium chloride or equal measure to keep that dust down. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Mr. Reiner, anything you want to add to this before I move to approve it? Okay. And then, uh, Mark, uh, I need to acknowledge that your daughter is in the audience today, and I want to ask her, does he talk like this at home all the time, too, with all this, this uh, zoning jargon or not? Not too bad. <laughs> all right, I will, uh, I will move to approve the permit. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Polmeyer. Any discussion? I had not seen Mark blush before, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, Public Works. Morning, John. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first item for you today under Public Works is we'd like to have you consider approval for us to purchase a new Bobcat A770. This is an all wheel steer loader from Lanham Equipment out of Norwood, Young America for $32,500, which is state contract price, plus applicable taxes and licenses, and the funding is in our budget for, uh, for this year. Uh, this price does include trade of a 2007 Bobcat that we have now, so net price of the unit was um, you know, around 57000 and then after trade with the state pricing, it is $32,500. All right, any questions? And move to approve, Mr. Chair. Motion by Commissioner Kruger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Wright. Any discussion? Hearing now, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item B, uh, consider approval to purchase a John Deere 1550 more in deck for a Midwest machinery here out of Glencoe. That is also state contract price for 19500 plus uh, applicable tax and fees. And that is also in the, it's in the fairgrounds budget actually, and that more will be used uh, primarily at the fairgrounds. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the uh, purchase of the John Deere 1550 more. Motion by Commissioner Schemanski, is there a second? Second, second by Commissioner Kruger, any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item C, we'd like you to consider approval of a memorandum of understanding between McLeod County and the city of Winstead for a reconstruction project on McLeod Avenue in Winstead, Minnesota. McLeod Avenue is a city street in Winstead. Uh, city of Winstead has been awarded a local road improvement grant, LRIP grants, you've heard them called in the past from the uh, state of Minnesota. And Winstead is not a state aid city, meaning they do not get um, state aid assistance. We have to help shepherd that through the process and um, uh, work with the state on the funding for it, kind of be the, the middle guy for that whole thing. And we've done that in the past. There's no county obligation for funding or anything. Uh, last one I recall, we did one with the city of Stewart, received some of that funding years back. So um, it's not new to us. 
Mr. Chairman, I move the approval of memorandum of understanding between McLeod County and the City of Winstead for the reconstruction project of McLeod Avenue in Winstead. Motion by Commissioner Schemanski. Is there a second? No second that. Second by Commissioner Polmeyer. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item F, I'm sorry, item E. We've, uh, next few items are a number of uh, bids we've taken for this year's construction. Item E is SP 43070-013. SP is state project, so this is a federal funded project uh, for our county HSIP six inch edge line traffic striping. HSIP is a federal acronym Highway Safety Improvement Program. It's um, federal safety funds that have been in place for a number of years that we've been um, fortunate to receive over the years, different projects. Um, the low bid for that was traffic marking services out of Lake Maple Lake, Minnesota, with a bid of $55,581.06. We also had another bid from AAA striping out of St. Michael for $63,251.20. And we recommend award to traffic marking. Contingent upon MnDOT state aid and federal aid approvals, which we don't anticipate any problems, but being it's federal, it's Got to get a couple more looks. All right. Any questions, sir? Yes. Question, if I may. John, these are the fog lines on the outsides of the roads? Uh, correct, yes. And how many miles of fog line do, does this co contract in, entail? Uh, off the top of my head, it's around 60 to 100, I want to say. So this is costing between 500 and 1,000 bucks per, per mile to, to put the fog lines on. I usually look at it by the gallon, so I got to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't mean to put John on the spot either yet, but uh, I mean, how do you, do you just try to take the worst ones, or I mean, you just, you have a, a, a sheet list that you... Yeah, so so to be eligible for the the, the HSIP funds, you we've had to, these are roads that have been um, identified in our county road safety plan, the last current plan, and um, the, some of the roads were identified to get six inch edge line. Typically, edge line on the roads were four inches for a number of years. And over the last number of years with, you've heard the towards zero death TZD movement, um, wider edge lines, you know, four inches to six inches, uh, better visibility for, for the drivers and so forth. So that's kind of the, the higher safety component that's in that. These roads are selected. Um, we, try to, we try to either do, every year the road either gets edge line or center line stripe. That's been our goal. And this just, these roads fit in um, a cycle of, of that going on. Th these are the same roads that we probably used HSIP money on four to six years back. Mr. Chair, yes. John, I'm glad I asked because I didn't, I, I didn't catch the four to the six, six inch marking. Do, do you get into the rumble strips at all on any of these or do, do, they, do we do much of that on a county road or? Yeah, we've had one safety project. Um, I believe it was just one so far with, um, with rumble stripes we've done. Uh, we plan that we have an HSIP project next year, I believe it is, to do uh, rumble stripes on the past concrete overlay we had west of Glencoe and also on the reconstruction projects we're doing this summer. So we, we use federal safety funds. We apply for, for rumble stripes on this edge line as well and sometimes center line stripes. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for John? We need a motion. I do. Mr. Chairman, I move the... Uh, Approval of con consider the award of SP 43-070-013 for countywide HSIP six inch edge line striping. Second. Nope. Motion by Commissioner Shemansky, second by Commissioner Kruger. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And the next item is to consider approval for the award of our annual seal coat uh, and countywide pavement marking and also. Um, to reseal uh, Lake Marion Park. The low bid on that was from Asphalt Preservation Incorporated out of Detroit Lakes, and the cost of that is $640,508.75. Again, that includes CP19-000-01, which CP we, County Project is how we've been uh, numbering those. And the, the pavement marking is $74,347.30. And the difference between that payment marking and the HSIP payment marking is really just the funding. We're doing, we're doing similar stuff with it. 
Um, item B is CP19-000-02. That's the seal coat portion. That was 548,578.47. And then we had an alternate bid to do seal coating on in Lake Marion Park. As you recall, back in um, I want to say 2013 or so, we did the we did the prime and seal through there. And it's time again. It needs another shot of a seal coat. Uh, the bid on that, or the quote for that I sh bid, I should say, was 17,582.98. And that is very close in line with what the price was for the roads as well. So we got a really good price on the Lake Marion portion, and I'd recommend we do that at, with this project as well. We did have some other bids from um, various bids, ranging from uh, the next bid, 640508 all the way up to $828,327.63. So... Again, we recommend award to Asphalt Preservation Incorporated. We've not worked with them before. It's a new, new to McLeod, but, and uh, they did provide a bunch of references, and I checked with some of the other counties that have used them, and they've had good luck with them. So we recommend awarding them. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just want to make one comment. Under item C for the Lake Marion's seal coating, that money um, is coming from the capital projects account because this money was not in the budget for 2019. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions for John on item F? Move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Wright. Is there a second? A second. Second by Commissioner Pohlmeyer. Any discussion? Hearing on proceed to vote, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And item G is to consider approval to award our 2019 centerline tiling project to Traxler Construction out of La Center, Minnesota. Their bid was 330508.25, and that is also in our budget for uh, 2019. The roads we were doing with this project was County Road 60 between Trunk Highway 15 and County State Highway 7, County Road 63 between our County State Highway 22 and County Road 93 and County Road 79 between County Road 4 and Swan Lake Park, and County Road 93 between County Road 15 and County Road 1. The, proje the project did, it was a little higher than our, than our engineer's estimate, and a lot of that was due to, um, the, we're, we're requiring the contractor to, to, to backfill the road a little bit, and to do the shaping and so forth afterwards. In the past, we had our county forces Haul, haul the P Rock and do the shaping and do some of that. So um, we've talked to the contractor and he's willing or he's um, he would like to work with us as far as that we can potentially reduce that if we can indeed do do some of those again. You know, given the workload we got this summer with other maintenance projects, um, we're hoping we can fit this in and I think we can reduce that a little bit from um, from where it is now. John, I know, at least I think I know. Item A or 60 to, you know, between 15 and 7, that's earmarked for that cement stabilization, right? Correct. Or at least we're talking All about. All of these roads are earmarked for that down the, in the future. And that, was, and that was my next question whether they all were. I guess to follow that up, we've we had some questions about the project that we have, and we're aware of that. That doesn't mean that, you know, I or I don't think anybody's opposed to looking at future ones, but does this commit us to that? I mean, I is this... It. You know, if you look at other um, gravel roads, we've, we've tiled other gravel roads over the years, um, and any drainage we can get in the old gravel roads, you know, most of them were built from an old push up the farm field with black dirt and put some gravel on, that's your gravel road. So any drainage we can get down them, um, I think it's beneficial to the road, regardless of what we do to it in the future. If you leave it gravel, you put another treatment on or you put concrete or bituminous on in the future. So this... And that's why it doesn't commit us to necessarily any type of surface at this point. No, I don't know. Mr. Okay. Okay. Chair? Yes. Uh, the, I have two questions, John. This, this includes reclamation. What does that mean? I so 63 is an old, it's, um, it's about a mile of road west of Lester Prairie. It's old, it's, um, it's bituminous now, blacktop. It's in real poor shape, um, cracked up and so forth. So we want to um, reclaim that with You're this. You're going to grind it. Or, I mean, grind that's it what back up, yes. And my second yeah. And we're looking at options with that, being the road is in the condition it is, we might be able to tile that will just um, trench it down the middle in the condition it is. Okay. And then leave that for future um, 
So we're, we're looking at that too, but that well, was I, the idea. I would agree. I'm, the tiling, I mean, that's that, to get a good, you know, good base is what makes a good road. And yeah. if you can't, I mean, the tile obviously help with frost boils and it takes years before they really seek the water finds them and works the way it's supposed to. <laughs> Excuse me, my question, we use Trexler and I know we've got a good working relationship and what I've known of them, they, they work really well, but how did we end up, I mean, were, were any local guys bid it or? or uh, it, was, it was open to everybody. Um, one of the things we did require was that we, we trench it in. So you have the big um, the wheel picture of a ditch, which trenching yeah. it versus a plow that plows it in, which I don't, that we didn't want to do that. Some of the local guys only plow. Okay, no, and that's fine. That's a good, that's an, that's a good answer, but I was just wonder. And the I, one who's done in the past, uh, Vreeman was the one who did it um, last time on County Road 54 and 62, and they're no longer in the business of the tiling portion. So Traxler's done um, lots of work with MnDOT. We've never used them, to my knowledge, but um, they're a good outfit. Yeah, I've heard, I mean, I know of them, and they're, yeah, the, no complaints from the different right. counties and people that use them. Thank you. Ron? Mr. Chairman, uh, John, the, the, the uh, starting and ending points, are, are this, is this a continuous tile from the start to end point, or is there just, are you just going to do trouble spots in those No, it'd be, it'd be tiling from one end to the other, along with um, head walls and outlets at various low points along the road in different portions. Okay. That was one of my questions was, does it follow the topography? And, and then the other question is, uh, in situations, I know on number 60 or on uh, 79, we have some circumstances where the water table or, or the local water level is very close to the road service surface. Is the contractor going to be able to assure us that they're going to get adequate drainage in those roads? We'll have a pre-construction meeting with them. If they identify any concerns, we'll look at it. You know, the goal would be to put it along the way, four foot deep, three to four feet deep. Um, there's some areas we have to go a little lower, most likely, given the topography. Um, we'll have to work with that and move outlets or do, you know, work with some stuff so you don't get any water trapped. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is a pretty sure solution to a lot of the, the frost boils that we see in some of these roads. I wouldn't... Um, I'm not going to stamp it as a sure thing, but um, it's certainly been beneficial as long with, um, with other stuff, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, I should add, I want to add that, um, you know, we were trying to go back on some of the past telling we've done on County Road 54 and 62 and get, I round up a camera. Some of the smaller cities we've been trying to might reach out to Stewart and some other cities to see if we can go um, camera some of those tiles just to prove that they're working to see what, what kind of water flows are we getting in the spring. So. That's, we're, we're trying to do that now, this spring. Okay, good. All right, other questions? Otherwise, we need a motion. Move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Wright, is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Kruger, any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you. you. <clears throat> Parks, Al. Good morning. <clears throat> I have uh, three projects that have to be added to the bathhouse, Petenburg bathhouse remodeling. Um, I'll just go down. First one is uh, adding hair dryer, hair dryers, hand dryers to the, the bathrooms. We went away from paper towels. For some odd reason, paper towels burn when they're in the garbage cans. So we went to hair, hand dryers. Uh, and that wasn't in on the initial bid letting. So. Um, that comes to four dryers for $2,740. I don't know if you want to take them all. And I think we got to take them separate. Okay. Unless Mike tells me different, but I think we do. I'll move to approve the hair dryers on, on A. Let's go with hand dryers. Hand dryers. Hand dryers. Hand dryers. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Motion <laughs> <laughs> by Commissioner Kruger. I'm going to do it now. Um, is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Pohlmeyer. Any discussion? There should be, Mr. Chair, there should be some sa savings. I, 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 paper towels do burn. Yes. So I, I know that too, but actually there should be a savings. Yep, so it with makes paper a lot less of a mess. Any further discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The second one is adding a, a mixing valve. It's only one mixing valve. I have down four. Uh, the mixing valve would be going to the four showers, and this would 
guarantee, showers and sinks would guarantee that we won't have scalding water coming through them. Uh, Department of Health has said that we have to have these. Um, so that came to $1,137 for just one. You know, we only need one. Not so that's not the, that's one of them? Just one. Okay, very good. Mr. Yes. Chair? Yes. Is that a manual? Is that a, or is it, is that a manual mixing valve? You set it? Well, they'll, they'll set it for a temperature and then it, it won't go above, it won't let the water come any hotter than that in, okay. into that system. So it is thermostatically controlled. I mean, yep. I'm, I have a little, I'm familiar with them. Some are yep. manual and some are automatic. And this wasn't in the bid either. Okay. So. I move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Kruger, second by Commissioner Wright. Any discussion? Here now, we we'll proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And Mr. the third one is uh, Department of uh, Health has mandated that we tile the shower floors. And that wasn't figured in on the bid. Um, it'll be done in all four showers. Uh, the showers are two by two. Um, and the bid for three for four of those are $3,338. We've got the tile picked out. And then they also have to have a, a rubber liner in, and that has to be approved by the some state inspector. Is this with insulation? Installation. This is installation too. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, just because we have our captive audience, I, I just was going to remind everybody these are just like unfunded mandates. We're required, we're required to do them. So here we're spending money that we have no choice but to do uh, if we're going to have these facilities. So with that, I'll move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Kruger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Pohlmeyer. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Al, was this originally intended to be just concrete floors in the showers? Yep, concrete with epoxy on top of it, a sealant. Okay. So and, and the liner needs to be installed between the concrete and the tile. Is that correct? Yep. From my understanding, yep. Okay. It's so the the water can't come back up. Okay. From all right. I was thinking that water going down shouldn't no, hurt the them. No, water going down won't be a problem. It's okay. water coming. I guess they've had problems with that in the past in okay. other parks. All right. I, I could see that, you know, break, lifting the tile loose if you had, yep. you know, groundwater seeping in. So thank you, Al. Mr. Okay. Chair, I think it's it, from the experience I've had, it's they don't want any content. It's not so much the water, it's, it's the content. You can get different are not diseases, but there's different things that can come with that polluted water that comes back up. And yep. Yep. All right. Is there a motion to approve? Do we have that? I did. Yeah. Okay, I lost track. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, I'm being. Mr. Chair, if I may, could we take five minutes? Yes. That's, okay. And that's exactly the message I'm getting. So we'll take five minutes and then uh, finish out the board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, next on the agenda is County Attorney Mike Young and his annual report. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I start out by mentioning that. Our job is drug, sex, booze, and gambling. That's what we do in criminal prosecution. And what we are trying to accomplish when we prosecute individuals for the wrongs that they've committed is to seek re rehabilitation so they don't do it again, seek retribution so they get punished, to seek restitution so those who have been wronged are less wronged, and in the very worst cases, we want to lock them up and throw away the key. Thankfully, we don't have an awful lot of those. And unfortunately, it's very, very, very expensive to lock people up and throw away the key. It costs $35,000 to $40,000 a year to keep somebody in our state prison. It costs over $100 a day to keep somebody in our county jail. Uh, so our criminal justice system is expensive. It costs all of us an awful lot of money. And if we can work on the rehabilitation side, along with a fair dose of retribution, hopefully those costs will go down in the future. Although that is an optimistic view viewpoint and unfortunately the statistics are not bearing that out. 
On page number one of, of your report, you see a listing of the felony and gross misdemeanor adult criminal charges that we levied in, in the calendar year 2018. That is a total of 489. That is slightly down from the number in 2017. Interestingly enough, it's about 80% male, about 20% female. When I started way many years ago, back in the 80s, it was 90% male and 10% female. The number of assaults went down slightly from 54 in 2017 to 47 in 2018. The alcohol impaired driving offenses, and, and these are multiple offenses, <coughs> either two and 10, three and 10, four and 10 years, or there are offenses that are over a .16, or there are offenses with children in the car, or any combination of all of those factors. Though those numbers decreased slightly from 81 in 2017 to 73 in 2018. The bad news, and you will hear this throughout what we're talking about this morning, is the drug charges went from 129 in 2017 to 160 in 2018. Drugs are a major scourge upon our, our county. They cost us a lot of money and they cause our children an awful lot of pain. By the way, feel free, free to interrupt if you have any questions about any of this as we're going through. The main drugs that we are seeing is marijuana and methamphetamine, although we have seen co cocaine and heroin as well. About 45% of our cases are generated by the Hutchinson Police Department. About 25% are generated by the Sheriff's Department and the remainder are generated through the state patrol, through DNR, or through other uh, city police departments, and a couple have come from, from out of county. The theft offenses uh, have decreased from 33 to 28. The criminal sexual conduct charges have increased from 15 to 18. And the vast majority of our criminal sexual conduct cases are not a violent rape where somebody's pulling a knife on an unknown person and then forcing sexual intercourse upon them. It typically involves family members. It typically involves what started out to be a consensual dating re relationship and then through uh, one of the parties becoming terribly impaired by alcohol or, or drugs, then, then being uh, raped without their, their consent. So, we, we do see violent sexual rapes, and there probably aren't any, any that are really not violent, but uh, the gun, the knife, those types of assaults co combined with crim sex just don't, don't happen often out here, but an awful lot of them are relationships. An uncle engaging in sexual contact with his or her niece, uh, an aunt engaging in sexual contact with his or her nephew or, or niece. <clears throat> On page number two of, of, our, of our report, it describes our welfare fraud in investigation program. This is run by Jim Nielsen. He is a part-time fraud investigator in our office. And the goal of this program is uh, to, to uh, preserve program in integrity. The majority of our cases are from recipients of welfare failing to report income that they have or failing to report who was residing within their, their residence. For instance, if a woman and her child apply for public assistance and are living by themselves, then only the income of the two of them is considered. If the biological father of that child should move in then they must report his presence and any income that he, he may have, and that goes to determine the grant that they receive. So a fair number of our cases are either that the uh, 
that the biological, one of the biological parents who is not listed on the application moves in and is not re reported or has income which is not reported. Lower down on the social service side is, is truly the tragedy of the work that we do and I, and I give Amy Olson in our office a great deal of credit and the child protection folks at social services and the investigators within Hutchinson and at the sheriff's office. The TPRs are termination of parental rights cases and that's where children are living in homes where it is um, unfit for, for them to, to be in, either because of the condition of the home or because of the condition of the biological parents so that we go into court and, and, and we seek to sever the parent-child re relationship and free that child up for adoption elsewhere. Um, un unfortunately, we have way too many of those cases. Last year, we had 19 cases involving 36 children. The year before, we had 17 such cases involving 22 children. CHIPS cases are children in need of protection or services. And those can be, uh, mainly they are <coughs> children who are the, uh, the, the children of drug addicted or drug using parents and, and are in need of protection because of that chemical use or alcohol abuse by, by the parents. And permanency means that, that we don't have any hope of reuniting the child with the parents, but the child is old enough that the child is, is within a couple of years of, of being an adult so that we, we just seek a permanent plan for that child uh, away from their parents um, un until they reach the age of majority. If you total up <coughs> the, the termination of parental rights cases, the CHIPS and the permanency, we had 70 cases of such in McLeod County last year involving 124 children. That's 124 kids who, whose lives have been thrown into turmoil primarily because of the misdeeds of their parents. And they are the ones that are suffering. It costs our taxpayers an awful lot of money, but that money is nothing in comparison to the trauma that they caused to, to those children. So uh, we ought always think about the, the financial aspect, but the most important aspect is what about the kids? And those 124 children got something that, that they didn't sign up for, that they don't de deserve, and hopefully, through intervention, they, they will re recover. Uh, in the prior year, we had 70 such cases for 126 ch children. <coughs> misdemeanor and petty misdemeanor cases. Uh, that's probably what involves this audience a uh, fa fair amount since they're teenagers and, and either are driving or are going to be driving in the near, near future. Um, we had 631 such charges this year compared to 711 last year, and that's on page three of our report. Again, the, the major offenses are licenses, people not having a license, people having a license that's revoked, or people driving on a learner's per permit when they're not supposed to be, in insurance offenses, and speed. If we can ask all of you, please slow, slow down. We, we heard about the towards zero death. One of the greatest causes of deaths on our, on our roads, and you'll hear Dr. Quinn talk about that uh, within the next 20, 30 minutes, but um, it's, it's high, high speeds and inattentive driving and driving while impaired uh, uh, fences. So kids, slow, slow down if you can. And if you can't, then don't drive. Going to page five, the, these are the juvenile offenses which our office uh, prosecuted in 2018. And here the goal primarily is rehabilitation. Uh, and we, we do have some degree of attempting to get restitution for, for the victims, uh, but punishment is, is not a primary goal. It's re rehabilitation. And again, the, the greatest number of offenses that there are are in the, in the alcohol use, the thefts. There were 71, if, if you look at possession of drug paraphernalia and possession and or sale of drugs, you add those two together, 
So 71 out of our 371 juvenile charges were, were drug-related uh, offenses. The ages of our children and whether they're male or fe female is broken down on page six. And again, um, you, you notice that 80% were, were male in, in the adult forum, 20% female. Once you get down into the juvenile area, it, it gets a lot more evened out. Here it was 171 or roughly 60% versus 40%. And then we also do a diversion pro program, and that is that we uh, have people who are uh, charged with status offenses, and what status means is that it's, it's a crime only because of their age, so that's minor con consumption and possession of drugs or, or drug paraphernalia, or low dollar amount for first time thefts or shopliftings, and we, we divert those in, into a, to a program uh, so that they can get punished, so they can get re rehabilitated and not have anything on their record. Mike? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mike, uh, on that diversion program, I noticed the numbers for 18 are down considerably from our previous trend. Is that good, a good sign or are there more egregious offenses that are pushing them into further Well, the drug offenses are up so, substantially, so, so my, my hunch is <clears throat> that many of what used to be a smaller level uh, p possession of mar marijuana uh, of offense that would qualify for diversion are, are now into the meth or, the, uh, or, or other drugs or marijuana wax that we would not consider for, for diversion. Okay, all right, thank you. That's just a hunch, but um, the, the, the appeals that, that we have handled on behalf of the county in the criminal matter are, or in the criminal system are, are laid out in pages eight through 12. On page 13, these are the real estate tax appeals that we have handled on, on your behalf and on behalf of the assessor's office uh, in trying to preserve the integrity of our real estate tax system. This is an area where you as the county pay 100% per of the administrative costs of, of the system. Uh, you, you, you pay for, for the assessor, you, you pay for the county attorney, and the benefit is spread roughly one-third city, one-third school district, and one-third county. And I'm not gonna go into any of these on an individual basis, but that is the ones that we handled on, on your behalf and the results. On page 16, there are two, two uh, two categories, one is sexually dangerous persons and the other is mentally ill and dangerous. These folks are people who are either mentally ill or have committed sexual uh, offenses and we, we believe that they are likely to, to commit to uh, reoffend, and therefore they are committed to state hospitals and to state tra treatment programs. Um, un unfortunately, the SDP people the, these folks cost about $140,000 a year, and the county ends up paying about 25% per, per of that uh, directly through its, its taxing, uh, through, through social services. The remainder is a part of the state budget, but it's all tax dollar. Um, mentally ill and dangerous is not as expensive, but it is still very, very costly. Um, the civil matters that we've handled on, on behalf of the county are, are listed on pages 18 through, through 21. The forfeitures are listed on pages 22 through 26. And the way the property gets forfeited in the state of Minnesota is that if you commit certain drug or alcohol offenses or other violent offenses, then the property that you use to, to commit the, those offenses goes to the state through a forfeiture per proceeding. You see that many of these are automobiles or cash. So let's say that uh, Johnny Smith gets arrested while, while driving a Jeep and has 500 bucks on his person and he's got a couple grams of, of methamphetamine in his pocket. If he gets arrested, charged, then the, then the Jeep and the money both are, are subject to, to forfeiture because they're related to a crime of of drug use. Page 27, 
is uh, child support. And this is some of the most important work that, that our office does in that it helps people stay off of public assistance and it, it uh, encourages accountability through requiring non-custodial parents to be responsible for their kids. Notice in the total dollar amounts, the greatest amount that we ever co collected in child support was back in 2008. That tells you the economic consequence of the Great Re Re Recession and that the people who are in the childbearing years have not re recovered from that re recession yet. They are, we are collecting less than, than we collected a decade ago in, in child support. A part of the reason for, for that is, and, and what's on here, by the way, is the number of, of uh, court appearances is 335, and the new cases are, th are 34. Those are either child support co collection cases where we're bringing the non-custodial parent in to either say, why aren't you paying, and if you don't pay, then you will go to jail, or is the amount that you are paying fair, and if not, what, what is a fair amount? Just recently, I, I heard on 60 Minutes, uh, Fed Chairman Powell, uh, it was about two to four weeks ago, he, he spoke of a very low unemployment rate that we have within our country in the area, uh, it's under four four percent, and that is very, very good. He also spoke about something that is very, very bad, and that is a low, uh, low labor pool participation rate. Unfortunately, there are an awful lot of young males, ages 20 to 40, who have checked out of our economic system. And they check out either through incarceration, through drug and alcohol abuse, through drug and alcohol tre treatment, uh, through mental illness. And these are, these are the folks that you are seeing in our felony and gross misdemeanor cases they are the ones that you are seeing in our TRPs, our, our CHIPS cases, and our permanency cases. We, we have a small but substantial group of people that are not kind of contributing, and they are very, being very, very costly. Where does that end up taking us? T time will, will, will tell. We, we had a, a probation violation hearing on a defendant about three or four months ago, and the, and the probation agent said, this person has tried six treatment programs in the last three years that have cost you $85,000. I can't recommend in good faith any more treatment. Send them to prison. And the question gets to be is, we cannot will treatment onto people that don't want to be treated. So the question is, how do we handle the, these folks? And a part of it is money, but remember the biggest part is those, those, uh, those 124 kids that, that we were talking about. Because they are the one, ones who are paying the price. You and I are not. We are paying through our pocket. They are paying with their soul. I'd be happy to hear any questions or answer any questions. Any questions for Mike? <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Mike, the, the last uh, series of comments you made about the, the young adult males, uh, we are, have been conducting a, kind of an economic survey with our employers around the county, and that is one of the issues that the employers even stated, that they have a difficult time employing the, the young adult males, that they, they're missing the work ethic that, you know, most employers are searching for and so that it kind of goes back to you know the the moral compass of, of the the young person are they uh, you know willing to work and improve themselves or are, are they just kind of trying to slide through society um, and not being productive well and it's important to to realize that the vast majority are are driven want to do well want to be kind of contributing members but we have a substantial small mi minority and that's the folks that I am talking about, and I'm assuming that you are talking about right. as well. Anything else? 
Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Dr. Strobel, we told you 10. It's now 10.25. We're right on time for us, so thank you for coming. <laughs> It's nice to sit and it's nice to hear the, well, sort of. But it's probably good that I follow him. It, it flows a little bit more naturally, unfortunately. So, uh, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Strobel. I'm the chief medical examiner for McLeod County. Uh, and each year I come and present. It's like I'm kind of talking to them, but I'm facing you guys. You know who I am. Uh, each year I present a summary, thank you, of the deaths that occurred in McLeod County for the preceding year. So, this will be. 2018, and briefly for the folks in the back, uh, the medical examiner is um, a little bit like the TV shows where we do autopsies on criminal cases, you know, uh, homicides, etc. But we also are an arm of public health, um, and so we investigate natural deaths that are unexpected um, due to infectious or uh, premature disease. Um, as well as looking at drug and alcohol abuse. So in my report, take this staple out here, um, we have the statistical report of the preceding five years, and you can see, you know, just kind of with life, the ups and downs um, of the total numbers of cases. And you can see, you know, when we first, um, the first year, 2014, we had 21 autopsies. We went down to nine, and then now we're back up. Um, to 19. And some of those places where we've had increased um, deaths have been the motor vehicle crashes, um, and we have a few more substance abuse deaths this year. So for 2018, um, our autopsy had 222 deaths reported to us. Uh, of those, um, 159 um, total cremations were approved. Um, actually, it was 18 autopsies. I don't include the examination on the non-human uh, remains in the uh, more detailed report. So it's really 18 plus one. Um, our office declined jurisdiction on 189 of the deaths reported to us. To decline jurisdiction just means that the medical examiner has investigated the death, found it not to be um, a medical legal or public health issue, and we allow the physician, the primary physician, to sign the death certificate. Um, we assumed jurisdiction or signed the death certificate for 11 folks, and of those four required an autopsy. Um, and each one of them um, died of a different um, issue. One died of heart disease, one died of complications of chronic alcohol use, uh, one was an intrauterine fetal demise, and another died of uh, complications of a seizure disorder. Of the accidental deaths, um, there were six motor vehicle fatalities, um, and why do I have six? Oh, because one was a, a remote um, issue. So six incidents occurred in 2018, uh, and as um, the county attorney pointed out, the vast majority of the non-natural deaths that we see are going to be males. So all of the motor vehicle, vehicle, vehicle excuse me, fatalities were male except one. Uh, the decedents ranged in age from 21 to 60 years, and we have quite the library of substances present um, in those, I think, mostly drivers. Cocaine, two had ethanol, uh, marijuana, and methamphetamine, all things that are not good for driving a car safely. What is ethanol? Alcohol, drinking alcohol. Um, five deaths were attributed solely to substance use, so they were uh, called overdoses. Um, almost half and half, but three males, two females, ages 28 to 55 years. And again, a variety of substances detected, including acetyl fentanyl, which is one of the fentanyl analogs that is in the news lately. Um, I think there's a mis- it should be ty tiazolam. Ugh, it's a benzodiazepine that's not commonly used um, prescription-wise. Uh, fentanyl itself was present in two incidents, two incidents of methamphetamine. Uh, metragenine, which is also more commonly known as kratom, which isn't quite illegal yet. Can you get on that soon? That'd be great. Um, and then one person died from huffing. Uh, there were no deaths. What is huffing? Uh, where somebody uses dust remover or gasoline or air freshener and um, they 
inhale it into their lungs to try to get high. Uh, it can cause uh, heart arrhythmias, it can cause seizures um, and hypoxia just from inhaling gases that are not oxygen. So again, another bad thing to do. Um, Four deaths were classified as suicide. The majority, again, were men, uh, and three deaths were due to a gunshot wound. The one examination that we did, um, that we call an exam, but wasn't really an autopsy, uh, somebody found some debris uh, in water that they thought was human hair, and it turned out actually to be plant material. Um, but we do, we'd rather know and, and let everybody know what they seeing or not seeing. We receive a lot of various items uh, throughout the year, non-human bones, what looks like hair. Um, we had, a, was it this county where the liver was found in the yard? No? Oh, that was, it was a deer liver. Can you imagine just going out in your yard and there's like a whole <laughs> liver out there? The deer's stomach was found um, down the road uh, as well. So sometimes the medical examiner's job can be fun. <clears throat> so if there are any questions for me or from the back, uh, be glad to Mr. answer any. Mr. Chair. Dr. Strobel, uh, the last item on your report is uh, cremations. It said 159 cremations were approved. Now, is that all cremations going on in the county or just certain ones that you, you have approval on? Um, anyone who died in McLeod County who was going to be cremated, will have the cremation approval will come through our office. So okay. it's the county uh, jurisdiction of where they died who would have to sign it. So. Um, if a McLeod County resident died in Hennepin County, Hennepin County would do their cremation approval. Okay, and that re re uh, cremation approval is sometimes if there's a suspicious cause of death, you could deny a cremation? Yes, yeah, or if it just needs follow-up or more details or the physician shouldn't be signing because it's an accident or an overdose, it's a way for the medical examiner you know, to catch these deaths before, you know, obviously, Unfortunately, peep bodies would be considered evidence. So before that evidence is destroyed, um, the medical examiner needs a chance to make sure that everything is, is okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Stroll? As always, thank you for making the trip. Yeah, sure, and, it's good and to see you over on, here. on this day where the students are with us. So we, uh, we appreciate that. Um, with that, um, I believe we're gonna release the students um, to the courthouse uh, uh, for uh, some more presentations. So board members, if you want to just keep your seats, but we'll take a couple minutes to let the noise settle down as they leave. Thank so, you, Dr. Strong. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, we are to the point of our agenda where we review our calendars. Rich, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, the last two weeks was uh, pretty busy weeks for me. We had the workshop after the last board meeting um, and then our social service public health meeting. Um, on the 20th, uh, I attended the weed informational meeting uh, put on by uh, Al Coughlin. Uh, it was very in informative to me anyway. 21st, I attended the MSSA conference in, at the Hilton for the one day. Uh, 22nd, we had our town meeting and uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Szymanski, for, for railroading that for us. Uh, thought there was some good information there. Um, also, after that meeting, uh, sat in on the review of the government center plans. Um, the 25th uh, informational meeting on County Ditch 32, which brought us to one of our actions for today. The uh, 27th at Planning Commission, which was another one of our actions today. 28th uh, uh, Employment Enrichment uh, Committee, uh, planning the Cinco de Mayo and some other events, and also uh, JD8 meeting, and on the 29th, uh, annual ditch meeting with, uh, I believe it's five or six other counties, and then also in the afternoon had a, a meeting. We got together and talked about long-term planning. Brings me up to today. Okay, uh, some of the same meetings as Rich, as well as uh, Murph meeting, and we'll be having an upcoming uh, SWAC meeting shortly to cover some of the things there. Uh, long range planning session with the county fairgrounds, and that will be a topic that the board will see uh, within a few weeks, I believe, uh, our long range planning for, for uh, the economics in McLeod County, and uh, also uh, a meeting with uh, on the, our solid waste building as we're trying to kind of redo the floor plan to uh, 
make better, better use of the space there. Uh, another thing to bring up, and it's slightly off topic, but yet it does have something to do with McLeod County. Um, over the course of the last year, I generally take advantage of opportunities to be involved in agricultural advocacy whenever, whenever possible. And, in the, and uh, over the past year, I've been involved with things in, in farm magazines, been on the evening news uh, a couple weeks ago in an interview with the Washington Post. And last week, uh, a TV crew uh, showed up at my farm where I was part of a documentary on uh, what seems to go an ongoing topic as uh, economic crisis on farms and how that deals with the rural uh, mental health. And <clears throat> the value of egg products has, has a long-term tendency to go up and down, and, and unfortunately, where we're at today is, is a very long, uh, drawn-out session of a downward turn. And the only thing that many farms are operating on is not so much cash flow, but, but burning equity to, to, in order to uh, uh, stay afloat. And uh, many of these opportunities that I've had over the past year have been with uh, Ted Matthews, who lives in Hutchinson. He's a single person through Minnesota Department of Agriculture that works with the rural mental health and how it relates to the farm economy. And uh, he's been in the paper quite a bit lately and pretty well runs a 24-7 hotline to, uh, uh, for individuals who are, who are needing, needing help. And uh, quite, a, quite a unique individual. But uh, our, our economics, uh, uh, where we're at, is, is definitely not good. Um, uh, several factors are, are a part of that. And one of the biggest ones is uh, currently not being able to globally trade like we normally do. Uh, the the uh, uh, damages from the, the tariffs, agriculture wasn't really part of this, uh, but it got drug in in a very short amount of time. Uh, within the past year, uh, the damages of the tariffs to the United States dairy industry has been declared to be $1.2 to $1.5 billion, and that is just the dairy industry only, not including corn, soybeans, hogs, and beef, so forth. Uh, Ted, last week, Ted Matthews was brought into uh, Nebraska uh, to help individuals there. For those farmers and ranchers are not only part of the same economic downturn that we are in, but they also had to deal with the catastrophic loss of the blizzard and floods. Uh, the estimated damage to their livestock industry has now exceeded $500 million. The damage to stored grain and feeds uh, is the same at $500 million. Their National Guard was actually deployed to drop uh, uh, bales of hay to starving cattle that were uh, stranded uh, between the floodwaters. And uh, it, uh, if you want to pay attention to any of the social media feeds as, as to what went on during the past few weeks in Nebraska, it's, uh, it's, it's very impressive, but it's also very sad to be able to watch their losses. Um, our primary trade partners are China, Mexico, Canada, Japan, and South Korea. Those are some of our biggest ones, and our hands are tied with not being able to cooperate with that international trade like we normally are a part of. The economic activity of agriculture goes further than the price of corn, soybeans, milk, and so forth. There are thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in the values that are produced. And our, we, here in the United States, we overproduce our domestic demand so that we can be a part of that multi-billion dollar, um, so that there, because those products are, are a multi-billion dollar component of our, of our economy as we send them out of here. And, uh, and we, we build our egg economy because we lead the world in production, innovation, and sustainability. But again, we have to have a global marketplace in order to get our prices back. Here in McLeod County, our, our farmers grow corn, soybeans, beef, pork, dairy, wheat, and several other products at what is declared at just short of a quarter billion dollars of annual value. So hopefully someday soon I'll be able to talk about these issues in more of a positive uh, manner, but uh, currently the economics have gotten agriculture in quite a, quite a tailspin. So uh, someday hopefully this will turn around. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, last uh, couple weeks a lot of the meetings have been covered, uh, including the workshop right after the meeting. Um, I did get to uh, go with Commissioner Kruger to the Capitol and testify to the Transportation Committee in the Senate um, regarding 212 and that project that we've heard a lot about. Uh, we got to tell our story, uh, however brief, um, but we got to be in front of that committee and hopefully uh, they heard uh, our needs uh, for that highway to uh, become a four lane all the way out um, to uh, McLeod County and beyond. Uh, we had a town hall meeting that was discussed that was a very well attended, I thought. 
Um, and uh, I heard some pos some positivity regarding the town hall <laughs> meeting, but not necessarily the uh, information that was shared. But uh, but the information nonetheless was shared. Uh, we had our annual um, uh, uh, drainage meeting or ditch meeting with um, with our, our 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 partner counties, <coughs> neighboring counties. Uh, attended a long range planning meeting last week, and then I just wanted to update everyone. This morning I was. Uh, I asked and, and did sign a, uh, a it's a, a memo or a declaration to uh, FEMA regarding um, um, some disaster relief, meaning we've had some road wash, washouts and some other damages because of the flooding. So our emergency management director, Kevin Matthews, is working under that and working with that and uh, we'll uh, put in for some funds if we do qualify for that. Ron? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since our last county board meeting, uh, I did attend the social services committee meeting where we uh, bid farewell to our um, former social services director, Gary Sprinsonatic. On um, Wednesday the 20th, I attended the weed information meeting with uh, a lot of township uh, officials uh, talking about um, noxious weeds and, and control programs that are, are available in our local area. Uh, a couple of those weeds are uh, wild parsnip and uh, Palmer amaranth, uh, both, both very aggressive, uh, sometimes uh, uh, herbicide tolerant uh, weeds that we need to uh, handle within the county. On the um, 21st, I attended the Pioneerland Library uh, Executive and Finance Committee meeting. On the 22nd, we held our uh, legislative town hall meeting, uh, and I do want to say a big thank you to McLeod County commissioners and staff uh, for all of their contributions. Uh, their input was very helpful. Uh, the staff did a marvelous job of uh, coordinating things. So thank you to uh, all of our McLeod County uh, folks. On um, Monday, the uh, 25th, uh, we had a brief meeting uh, in the Environmental Services Building uh, talking with public health about the uh, uh, WIC clinic uh, facilities within the uh, Environmental Services Building. And then we also had a meeting with uh, county staff on um, CD32 um, regarding the uh, um, hydrology study that we contracted for today. And then on the 26th, we had an informational meeting with property owners on um, County Dish 162140 and JD9. Um, that was very well attended. Uh, the folks were very appreciative of the work that we have. This was preliminary to accepting the uh, redetermination of benefits report that's coming up next week. On the 28th, we had an informal meeting with CD11 and JD11. Uh, landowners um, talking about that uh, process and uh, uh, the consensus there was that we should be looking at redetermination of benefits on CD11 and JD11. And then uh, the 29th we had our annual joint ditch meeting with our neighboring counties. Um, uh, we took care of business there. We also followed that with uh, joint ditch meetings number 28 and number 11 and then uh, that afternoon, we had the long-term planning, economic development discussion uh, with our county uh, commissioners at the fairgrounds, and that's all that I have since our last meeting. Thanks, Ron. Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to try to be brief here on some of the things that weren't covered already. Uh, I will expand on our, our uh, Commissioner Nagel and myself went to the Senate Transportation Committee uh, to testify. Uh, it, it actually was Senate File 714. Uh, Senator Jensen uh, proposed it, and um, we we had uh, uh, three counties uh, directly represented. I spoke towards Ren both towards Renville and and Sibley counties the need for 212. Uh, and again, uh, the Senate File 714 is is this is the second phase of 212, it's from Norwood to Cologne um, to keep going. They, they've left uh, the first phase from, from um, Carver to um, Cologne is pretty much uh, on the docket. So this is, this is the second phase to keep, to keep it moving. Uh, we had, again, commissioners from several counties, uh, city officials all the way out to Granite Falls. 
Um, these committees don't usually have that many people there testifying of, of the impact that 212 could help uh, uh, rural counties uh, and commerce, uh, plus uh, just mobilizing uh, our, our workforce to be able to come and go from the metropolitan area. I also uh, had uh, Trailblazer on the 21st. Uh, we did have our town hall meeting. Um, I, I, uh, there was Commissioner Nagel commented on some some things there. I, I mean, I don't know that uh, the press was quite honest with what was going on there, but sometimes truth is hard to hear, but necessary. I mean, of what the impacts of some of these things are going to do. I wish it was a little bit more directed to <coughs> specifically to McLeod County and what we're forced to do uh, with our property taxes. I also attended um, the High Island uh, Creek Board, High Island Creek Watershed Board meeting. Um, and we had uh, some more conversation on, on Baker's Lake, uh, uh, trying to convince uh, uh, the High Island uh, watershed to take responsibility for uh, Baker's Lake uh, and some of the things going there. Uh, there. There's a conversation of having Houston Engineering do an engineer study to uh, what is needed to help improve that. Uh, there's some talks that they're asking some for some funds from the counties um, that are directly involved, which includes McLeod. I'm not normally for that, but we have a certain ownership of the dam that's in there, so I, it's something that I'm going to have to talk to the rest of the board members in a workshop or something to s explain what exactly what they have in mind. Uh, I also attended the Buffalo Creek Watershed uh, board meeting. Uh, I attend on the 26th, and also that evening I attended the Midcare Pipeline Safety Program in Hutchinson. Uh, I've attended several of them. Uh, uh, they, they put on a nice safety program and show all the pipelines <coughs> all the way from residential to the main lines and the impact that they have uh, around McLeod County. Um, I had a North Fork Crow watershed meeting and um, mixed feelings. I don't know if I want to say sad to say, but the, the crow will cease to exist. We we have uh, we haven't did the official vote. It'll be on our next meeting to um, to uh, dismantle, as you will, um, the crow. Uh, there's going uh, the one watershed, one plan, and the SWCDs in that area pretty much can handle all the issues that we were handling on the crow board. Now, I, did that, does that mean that we don't have something else? Um, for the middle fork and the south fork, that remains to be seen, uh, and I'll I'll be trying to afford the Bormer as much and the SWCDs as much as I can to see what we need there for representation because one watershed, one plan is is moving into this area, and I I'd like to make sure we have uh, a seat at the table, if you will, to to shape uh, the one watershed, one plan. Um, I had Mid-Minnesota Economic Development uh, meeting on the 27th. That evening, I, I did uh, convince uh, the mayor of um, Plato, Tracy Montgomery. She's a new, it's a new mayor over there. She will be, she joined us on the board that evening, and she will be replacing Bobby Becker, uh, who was the mayor of Plato and sat on that board. I also had HRA on the 27th, uh, I guess for me, uh, I'm pretty happy, JD, we had a JD8 ditch meeting uh, to uh, help move forward. That's been, since since I was in office, I, it's been on my radar to get that ditch fixed through Helen Township up into Sibley County, and, and we're moving along slow but sure. I, um, uh, let me see. I also did, did the long range planning uh, committee uh, meeting with the rest of the board. Um, and some of my, I didn't have as many responses as I wanted to at the time of the meeting, but I am getting some flowed in and documenting them. So we'll uh, see what happens in our next meeting, which brings us up to today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Cindy, anything to add? I do not, Mr. Chair. All Thank right. you. I believe we're at the open forum of press relations and seeing no one, <laughs> literally no one. Yeah. 
I'm uh, seeing no more business. I'm looking for a motion to recess until our next board meeting, April 16th at 9 a.m. at the Glencoe City Center. Mr. Chairman, since we've uh, concluded all of our business in a timely manner, I move that we adjourn. Motion by Commissioner Schmansky. Second. Second by Commissioner Pohlmeyer. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you.